Near the end of Michael Jordan's career with the Bulls, he agreed to allow a camera crew to follow him around for a documentary on his last season in Chicago. Tim Grover, Chapter 1, Taking Flight. As many of you may know, this is the widely popular and renowned documentary on Angel that is currently being played on Netflix, which we all know as The Last Dance. Because of the current situation with COVID, a lot of us is looking for more NBA content. And what a perfect time for a documentary about the greatest of all time to come out. Exclusive content never seen before during the last and final run of Michael Jordan in 1998 shows us a side of MJ we never witnessed. It's really hard not to get excited for this documentary every week. Camera crews were with him for almost 24-7 of his life during that season. And early one morning, the camera crew was at MJ's house for a great glimpse of Jordan's gym session. Yeah, MJ working out, not surprising. But what I'm surprised about is how rare MJ workout videos are on the internet. And I'm not talking about MJ's hoop sessions. I'm talking about him working under a barbell and lifting weights. The cameraman noticed a poster on the wall, a classic shot of MJ soaring through the air with the caption, how does MJ fly? He zoomed into the poster, then turned to Michael and asked him, how do you fly? MJ just laughed, shook his head and said, ask him. And that was Tim S. Grover, MJ's trainer for 15 years. Now I began reading the book, Jump Attack by Tim Grover to learn how Michael Jordan trained throughout the off season so I can apply some of his exercises to my routine. I wondered, how did MJ run for so long while maintaining such a taxing NBA season? Well, the best way to do that is to read a book written by MJ's personal trainer of 15 years during MJ's prime years. My name is Tim Grover. I worked with Michael Jordan for 15 years. Everyone knows me as his trainer, but my official title was a sports enhancement specialist. Continuing on with Tim's story, he says, Good question. No doubt MJ's genetics gave him a physical advantage. He has those huge hands and long limbs and predominantly fast twitch muscles that allow him to do extraordinary things. But contrary to popular legend, he's not a freak of nature. What did Tim Grover mean by that? You mean the great Michael Jeffrey Jordan is not a freak of nature? The meaning behind Tim's statement is that to give credit to MJ's accomplishment and accolades to his genetics is grossly misrepresenting the reason of his success. Just like the feature greats such as Kobe and LeBron, it isn't their once in a lifetime genetics that built their success, but their commitment to becoming the best. It was their mental toughness that exceeds far better than their peers and their work ethic that is the main reason to their success. So if the trainer of the GOAT is saying the reason to MJ's success is not the genetics, but hard work. Why not just do it? When I started working with Michael in 1989, his vertical jump was 38 inches. We got him up to 42 inches and eventually to 48 inches before he took a break from the NBA in 1993 to play baseball. 10 inches over several years. Now if this is true, did MJ really jump 48 inches? A seemingly ridiculous vertical even for the highest jumpers in the world. To answer this question, let's start off during his college years, when most people are still developing their athleticism and starting to reach their peak. Now given that MJ was listed at 6'5", 195 pounds in his college years with the Tar Heels, and still grew an inch to 6'6", we can assume Jordan was a late bloomer. This is also backed up from the fact that MJ grew from 5'11", as a sophomore in high school, to 6'3", in his junior year and progressing to 6'5 into his college years. On March 1983, during the final regular game of that season, North Carolina played against Duke. In one play, the Tar Heels turned the ball over after Jordan passed it to the post. With Duke on the fast break, it seemed like Johnny Dawkins would make the easy transition layup. But of course, out of nowhere, there was Jordan flying up to the lane and getting up so high that he hits his head on the backboard. The play was a goaltend, but no one cared, and it was the fact that a 6'5 guard hit his head on the backboard. Now for a 6'5 guard to do what Jordan did, how high did he jump? Well, we know the height of the rim is 10 feet, and the bottom of the backboard is 6 inches lower, giving a height of 9 foot 6 inches. Michael was 6'5 or 6'6, six six, so based on simple arithmetic, 9'6 six minus 6'6 six six gives us 36 inches. So Jordan was at least jumping 36 inches and no one can refute this based on the video. Also, when someone is going full speed down the lane just like Jordan was, vertical speed is not the only speed at play and some of the energy is going horizontally. 
Therefore, MJ didn't even jump as high as. And if you study basic high school physics, you know that kinematics shows us that you don't jump as high if most of the speed isn't directed vertically. This is on the assumption that you're applying the same amount of force to the floor or getting off at the floor at the same initial speed. Naturally, running jumps require some horizontal speed alongside vertical speed. Because of it being an inherently speed-based movement, this is better explained by comparing long jumpers and high jumpers. Athletes competing in the high jump focus on converting or translating their horizontal speed into vertical speed. For long jumps, they try to maximize the direction of force they need to apply on the floor, which will allow them to travel the furthest. Ilya Ivanuk is a great example why high jumpers can be great dunkers using the vertical. High jump is a sport that can easily translate into single leg dunking. This is because high jump is a sport that focuses on getting the athlete's center of mass to the highest point. So the fact that Jordan had a lot of horizontal velocity in his jump, he was likely not jumping as high as he could. Regardless, he was able to hit his head on the backboard, and even then he was slightly above the backboard. So in 1982, in his sophomore year with the Tar Heels, we can safely assume MG was jumping at least 38 inches. But we know Jordan jumps higher than that. Surely he doesn't only jump 38 inches. At the age of 1920, like most athletes, Jordan hasn't reached his full potential in his athletic abilities. Fast forward to Jordan's early years with the Bulls, the pre-Pippin era where Jordan literally had no one else to rely on and had to carry the Chicago Bulls. This was also the time where young Jordan competed in the dunk contest, where he could display his amazing leaping ability without the worry of defenders hitting him in the air and potentially injuring him. Jordan had many various signature dunks, including the famous one-handed cradle dunk, which he would often display during wide open transition plays or his dunk contests. And also the famous lean dunk that to my knowledge, no one is able to replicate in terms of style and finesse. Side note, I think this dunk perfectly represents Jordan's superior athletic and physical ability. MJ had the air control, finesse, and large men hands to land this dunk. What do you even call this dunk? A windmill leader dunk? That doesn't even fully encapsulate this beautiful dunk. He palms the ball instead of cusping the ball like the usual windmill dunks. And back to the dunks I was talking about. The famous but highly underrated dunk is the reverse one-footed dunk. Jordan starts off on the right side of the wing and runs up into the low post, jumping to the other side and finishing up with a reverse dunk. Now Jordan has replicated these dunks in all of his dunk contests in 1985, 1987, and 1988. Nothing really stands out until you appreciate the airness and slow motion. You'll truly be able to appreciate Jordan's leaping ability. What's interesting is that each year it seems as if Jordan was able to jump higher in these dunks. In his first year in 1985, he was able to get his head above the lower backboard. And in 1987, Jordan is able to reach his head on the rim but ducks as soon as he is about to hit the rim. In 1988, Jordan is fully capable of hitting his head, but also has the ability to put his elbow into the rim. I don't think anyone's ever been able to do that. Again, back to the drawing board, if Jordan is 6'6 and the rim is 10 foot, Jordan needs to jump 42 inches to touch his head on the rim. But as you can see, at the age of 24, where most would consider an athletic prime year to be, Jordan was clearly able to touch his head on the rim. We also need to acknowledge that Jordan came into the dunk in an angle, contorting his body sideways and rotating. So if you guys are familiar with max vert testing, this is definitely not the most ideal way of jumping in a max vert. Also from this angle, you can see that Jordan is leaning his head backwards and not fully extending his head so he can avoid the rim. Based on this attempt in 1988, at the age of 24, we can conclude Jordan was able to jump at least 42 inches. Since he was clearly able to jump higher, I think it's a good estimate to say that he was able to jump 2-3 to three inches higher if he was going for the actual standard vertical jump test. So by this time, I think MJ was jumping 45 inches with a great degree of certainty. But now you might ask, what about the ridiculous whopping 48 inches of vertical that Tim S. Grover and many people in the media claim? Could he really jump that high, or was Tim Grover hyping up his book for the media and public? In my opinion, I think part of it was the hype, but there is some truth to it. 
Jordan was clearly jumping up to 45 inches before he met Tim Grover and was not jumping 38 inches in 1989. In fact, Jordan was jumping 45 inches at the age of 20. When he was at North Carolina in a motion analysis class project during 1983, Jordan was a subject for a max for jump test. Utilizing different parts of the subject's body as a marker, the subject's max vertical jump was carefully analyzed and measured. During the jump, Jordan was able to use his upper limb or his arm as a free swing to generate momentum. In the standing jump, Jordan measured at 35.93 inches which is considered elite to even pro dunkers. And for his running jump, he measured a whopping 45.76 inches, which is even greater than what we anticipated from the analysis of the dunk contest. This is done with a one foot approach. So if MJ had a max vertical jump measured with the Vanguard motion analyzer, recording a 46 inch vert at the age of 20, Tim is surely using his stories as a marketing tactic. MJ was not jumping 39 inches in 1989 at the age of 26 and did not get his vertical to 42 inches. Okay, but what about Jordan jumping 48 inches? Did he ever really jump that high? I think at one point he really did, especially during his early years in between 1984 and 1990. If let's say we told him to jump as high as he could so he could test his max vert, most definitely he would have been able to jump 48 inches. And knowing Michael, he would have taken that as a challenge and enthusiastically agreed. At the age of 20, he was already jumping a verified 46 inches off of one foot. Is it crazy or out of reach to say he gained 2-3 to three inches of vertical during the NBA? After all, most track or power athletes who participate in sprints, jumps, or throws on average hit their peak by age 25. Jordan was 25 at the 1988-89 season. Is it a coincidence that Jordan was able to do a reverse elbow dunk off of one foot in the dunk contest that year? I think not. And if we told Jordan then to jump as high as he could for a max vert, without a shadow of a doubt, I believe Jordan would have been able to jump 48 inches, if not even jump 50. To conclude, I think Tim Grover was wrong in his statements, but I believe he and Jordan knew it. After all, marketing is the best way to make sales after the quality of the product. And I'm sure his statement helped him make a few more bucks. But overall, I believe Tim was right in that Jordan did jump 48 inches, but just not in the correct timeline he stated. Anyways, that's it for the video guys. Originally, I wanted to make this video not just to solidify Jordan's actual jump height, but also largely in part to show that it wasn't Jordan's genetics that got him to where he was at, but his incredible mental toughness and the way he approached everything in life. Jordan called up Tim, his trainer, in part because he was getting beat up by the Pistons, but also because Jordan knew even being the best player, there was still much to improve in his game. And for him, it was to get stronger. So when the GOAT knows you can still improve even though he's at the top, what does this tell us when we aren't even close to being at the top? Alright, thanks for watching the video guys. If you guys stayed till the end, I really appreciate it. If you guys are new to this channel, feel free to check my other videos out. I make content on basketball, athletics, and development. And if you guys like this type of video and want more content like this, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. And make sure you turn on the notification bell. Alright, peace guys.